Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one like this in the seats in front of you. And uh, we're going to keep going through the book of John. We have uh, a few more things to cover in John 6. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but we're going to keep kind of kind of plucking through it. I would encourage you, uh, there's, there's a lot of doctrine this morning, a lot of uh, depth, a lot of verses to kind of... Uh, make sure we're, we're putting in solid bounds what's being taught because some people can run with some of these ideas and, and get off in some damaging places throughout history. And so uh, I would encourage you to take some notes. Uh, we'll have the slides on the screen for scripture, but maybe write down some of these things as they come. Uh, as we get started, you know, we hear Jesus talking about bread of life. Let's, let's talk for a minute. What's, uh, what, look at you guys, you're so awake and lively. Here we are. Everyone take a deep breath. I need that. That's good. What's your favorite food? Like, like just the most amazing food that you can imagine. If I had it up here, you'd be like, I would carnally eat that. I cannot contain myself. My favorite food is <laughs> ribeye, chocolate. Did someone say caffeine? Catfish. Okay, like caffeine. Caffeine crusted catfish. Huh? Huh? Someone said tacos. That's a wide variety, right? That's like uh, someone saying meatloaf, right? It's a lot of meatloaf. Uh, yeah. Cantaloupe. Cantaloupe, yes. There we go. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, I would say one of the best things I've ever eaten, there was a, a traveling family who, uh, whose uh, the wife was a nurse, and they lived in a, a camper, and they, they were at our church for like, I think they're supposed to be here like five weeks, and they ended up being here like 12 or 13. It was the, the Cox family. And James wanted to, to bless our family, and so he had bought these, uh, oh, what are the steaks that look like axes? Tomahawk! He bought, I mean, it was the big, it looked like it was cut fresh from a hunk of bovine creature, just this big thing. And he had slow roasted, he had drilled a hole through it and slow roasted it over an open fire for like eight hours. It was incredible. Anyway, uh, when I think of like my favorite thing I've ever eaten, aside from tiramisu, that steak was just like, man, some of you guys, you're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Some of you are like, I'm not there, I don't care at all. Any vegetarians? Sorry, I'm a fan. I need like, ah, sorry, no offense. Like, gross. Hey, um, here's the thing about food. Uh, I, something C.S. Lewis said I think is really interesting, and, and he was kind of hinting at a deeper thought, but he said, you can never, uh, he said, uh, I can never, but we change it here. You can never get a cup of tea large enough or a book long enough to suit me. That's what he said. You can, yeah, some of you tea people and book people. Now, uh, tea and book people, you're pretty excited about that. But also, here's something that's interesting about this quote. He's, he's not really pulling at just literally books and tea. He's calling to the idea that no matter what I have that I really desire, and the deeper you read C.S. Lewis, you clearly know he's going somewhere here. Uh, I want something more. I need something deeper. It's never enough for me. And, and all of us are captives to our physical needs. I mean, we, we all want something. We all want for something. And, and we could unpack that. And I mean, that'll preach all day, right? We all have these things that we're longing for, we want for. But they still come back to a basic physical need. Like we're hungry for lunch or we didn't eat enough breakfast or we really need caffeine or whatever it is. Like there's something that we need. And so we're, we're captives to that. That's what it means to be human. You have to consume something to survive. Welcome to humanity. It's okay that you're hungry because you should eat because otherwise you'll die, right? You should drink water because otherwise you'll die. We're kind of captive and controlled by that. And it's also never enough because I'm never going to eat something and not have to eat again. Uh, I ate this morning pretty early and I'm hungry now and then I'm going to eat. And also I want to eat. I love eating. Um, like I, man, I have to put a lot of boundaries on my life. Sometimes I have to count macros or do different fasting practices to teach my body and my mind like, hey, you can't have uncontrollable food in your life all the time. When we talk about spiritual discipline, and sometime next year and we go through fasting. We'll talk about that, how, how the, the history of fasting wasn't just to, to abuse yourself down to a place, but it was to recognize that, that man doesn't live on bread alone, that your stomach doesn't control you, that there's something deeper. And Jesus mentions that here. He says that I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Now, Jesus is a man. Do you think that he ate and drank that day? He's not an idiot, right? And it'd be so silly to, to think that Jesus is literally telling you that you'll never have to eat bread again, you'll never have to drink water again, because that would be foolish. Clearly, Jesus is talking about something deeper here. And I think he's pulling at this idea that C.S. Lewis is mentioning, that, hey, nothing will ever be enough. So we're going to talk about that this morning. Let's look at this. Uh, so you have at the first, verse 35, he says, I'm the bread of life. And verse 48, he says, I'm the bread of life. So you know what we get from that? Next slide. 
the Jesus sandwich. Huh? Because you, you have two slices of bread and then stuff in between. Come on, guys. It's like the cheesiest Baptist pastry thing I could do this morning. This is, the, this is, the, this is as good as it gets. It's all serious stuff. So it's the Jesus sandwich. Uh, uh, or more theological, they call it the bread of life discourse. It's the bread of life discourse. Say discourse. Discourse. It makes you feel like you're, you're important and potentially British. I don't know if you can say the word discourse without some sort of accent. Try it. You'll see later. So um, here's the focus this morning. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus because he loves you. Amen. Hear that. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus because he loves you. We're going to go pretty quickly through uh, verses 35 through uh, 43, and then we're going to camp for a while on verse 44. So if you want to open to John 6, we're going to get after that in just a sec. Uh, let's pray together real quick. Father, we take a moment to pause and to uh, have some sort of reverence as best as we can for your word. We pray that you would uh, use it in the power of your spirit as, as you always do, to guide, to correct, to convict, to teach, to draw us to you. Father, I pray even now that you would continue to be drawing us to you those who don't know you, those who think they know you, those who are, are near you and, and struggling. God, I pray that you would continue to draw us as you promise through Jesus Christ. May we believe. May we look to Jesus and live. Amen. Verse 35, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I said to you uh, that you have seen me, and yet you don't believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Hold on to that. As we talk about these things, and you get confused, and you might want to put labels on this like election, or, or uh, reform theology. Hold just before you start labeling things, just hear what Jesus just said. He literally just said that whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Hold on to that. There's something, there's something there about you coming to him. And we have to balance that with something he says later on that's, that's hard. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So what's that will? Well, keep reading. He tells us right now. Verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing. Say, lose nothing. Lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day. Four different times in this discourse, Jesus is going to say, I'm going to raise it up. That's a promise. Walking in death, everyone dies. But if you believe in Jesus, he's going to raise it up. That's a big theme in John. I should lose nothing that he has given to me, but I'll raise it up in the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. There's another time. He's saying I'm raising up. This is the will of the Father. Hear that again, verse 40. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. This is why we say in our church, look to Jesus. Say, look to Jesus. We don't just merely mean to casually glance at Jesus. We're talking about looking, gazing upon, beholding Jesus. And we condense that down to say, look to Jesus, because I would submit that if you're anything like me, that lots of postures and patterns and things in your life, you struggle to look to Jesus. In fact, the world, the flesh, and the devils, we talked about several weeks ago, is constantly pulling you to not look to Jesus, to look to yourself, to look to the world, to look to the community, look to society, look to the country, look to the school systems, look to whatever it is. Don't look to Jesus because, because it's all on you. You got to fix it. You and your society and, and your, your brethren, your family, your whoever, you got to fix it. And Jesus clearly says, no, 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 here's the will of the Father. You know what God wants? What does God want? The God who created everything. The God who knows you better than you know you. The God of everything. What's his will? His will is that you look to Jesus and believe in him so that you should have eternal life. That is so interesting. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus because he loves you. Verse 41, so the Jews grumbled. You can read this discourse here. It's so funny. They grumble. And then Jesus says, stop grumbling. Why do you grumble? Why are you grumbling? Do not grumble among yourselves. They're grumbling because they can't see Jesus. This is the will of God that they look to Jesus. And then they're grumbling because they just see him as, ah, isn't this just Mary and Joseph's boy? Just this, this Nazareth guy? Right? And they're grumbling. Can you think of another time when some Israelites were grumbling? Ah, oh, it's so funny. Go back and look. 
we talked, we preached about when we did through the whole Bible, and anytime we've talked about Exodus, there's just this constant pattern of Israel. God gives them stuff, and they grumble. Can you think of a time when Israel gets bread from God, and then they still grumble? Ah, John, gosh, the Bible's so cool, guys. John's doing something here. John wants you to think about Exodus 16, about Numbers 21. He wants you to be thinking, hey, wait a minute, isn't this, isn't this our pattern? Those of us reading, the humans, the Hebrews, those chosen by God, isn't this our pattern that God provides? And we grumble. We don't get it, and we don't like it. Dang it, this is stupid. I don't like manna. We'll go back to Egypt be slaves. That would be better, right? This is the tension. And John wants you to walk in that to see these things as parallel. And Jesus says, quit your grumbling. Stop it, you guys. You don't get it. And then we get to verse 44. Here's the punch. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus because he loves you. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws. Say draws draws. The Greek word here is, I took this out of my notes, you're going to get it for free anyway. The Greek word here is, uh, uh, later on, it's the same word used for when they draw the fish out of the water onto the boat. It's so full of fish. They're drawing it out. It's there. It's in the murky water. The fish are there. They have to draw it out, right? (coughs) Other Greek uh, poets have used the same word to draw water from a well. How do you get water from a well? Do you say, hey water, looking good, love you. Get on up here. You say, so good. You know you so wet. Come on, let's go. No! You have to draw it. You have to send something down there to bring it up, right? You guys are like, I've never drawn water in my life. But I imagine, I imagine this is how it works. I've never like literally used a well, but this is what happens, right? You've got the bucket and it goes down. You pull it up. This is that Greek word, to draw it out. No one comes to me unless the Father who sent, uh, who sent me draws them. And I'll raise them up on the last day. Raise them up again. It's almost like Jesus wants to know that your death doesn't control you. That you're not, uh, you don't need to find security in your life, in your power, in your strength, but that he will resurrect you. Saying it over and over and over. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I'll raise him up on the last days. It is written in the prophets that they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. First, let's talk about the Father draws you. The Father is drawing you to believe and trust in Jesus because he loves you. Let's talk about the Father drawing you. Does anyone in here have like a hard candy in their purse? Who's the cool mom that has hard candy in their purse? Raise your hand. Be that mom. Come on. We have no sweet old ladies with candy in their purse? I'm offended. Nailed it. No offense. No, seriously, when I was growing up in church, you like sat by these people, right? And like my mom would have it, and then if she didn't have it, you know someone else would. So you'd go sit next to them and be like, hey, if, if, I, if I get a little rowdy, I'm going to get some candy. Usually that strawberry stuff, I don't even know what you call that, but like every grandma has had that ever in her thing, the strawberry jar that's all congealed together. So, uh, <laughs> hard candy. That's all. That's all. I was just asking because I wanted to talk about hard candy. Say hard candy. <laughs> Thank you. So this, what we're about to talk about with God drawing you, it's like a hard candy. You look at it and you think, ah, that's hard. I don't want to eat that. I don't want to crunch on that. I don't want to put that in my mouth. But the longer that you eat it, the sweeter it gets, the better it gets. At first, you might be like, I'm not into this. This is, but man, the good stuff's there. The longer you suck on it, the longer that you you sit with it, it's like hard candy. Jesus says no one can, they're enabled. They don't have the ability. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. What's he saying? What's he saying here? Romans 8, 7 says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Your natural mind, the, the, the Bible uses the term flesh, you could say your natural mind, the, your state of mind in general, as you, as you are currently, you can't come to God. It's hostile towards God. Hostile! You, you know we're hostile? When we have uh, opposing countries who are hostile towards us. How does that make us feel? That's, that's not a good thing. If you have someone that's hostile towards your family, right? It says you're hostile towards God. I hope that offends some of us because we need to be offended by this. The gospel is first offensive. 
You are hostile towards God in your mind. You cannot come to God on your own. Romans 3, 10 through 11. None is righteous. <clears throat> no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. What, what's he saying here? Like, what is this? I mean, again, uh, stop before you get so concerned about different words that, that can categorize things like, oh, we're going to start talking about Reformed theology. We're going to start talking about Calvinism. We're going to start talking about election. Stop. Just read what the word says. Take what God's saying as you read this. Our natural minds are hostile to God. And you know that if you've ever known anyone who sins and struggles in rebellion, like yourself, like me. Naturally, there's a hostile tension of, I, I, don't, I don't want to go his way. I want to go my way. I want to march to the beat of my drum. I want to do what I want. Natural mind is hostile to God because he is right. He has all authority. He's God. And so naturally, I want to oppose that because I want to be God. I want to decide good from evil. Genesis 3, anyone? And then Romans 3 comes in and says, none of us is righteous. Righteousness, again, reminds you, we'll mention this later, but it's a relationship word. We tend to think about righteous as being just actions, but those actions are still in the boundary of a relationship. When, when we read later that he gave us righteousness, that, that the righteous for the unrighteous, we're talking about a right relationship with God, a right relationship with each other, and a right relationship with ourself. That was broken when we said, no, 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 no. We don't trust you. Can, can God really take care of you? As Genesis 3, the serpent said, is God, did God really say, can you really trust him? No, no, no. You could be like God. You could decide good from evil. Then we rebelled. We broke our relationship with God. And then later on, you see uh, in Cain and Abel, right? Oh, we can't even have relationships with each other. We're going to start killing each other because, because we get this scarcity mentality. I'm not in control. Something else might be above me. Someone else might be more pleasing to God than me. So I will kill for that. We have a broken relationship with ourselves, with each other, with God. This is unrighteousness. Righteousness is having a right relationship, who you're created to be in right standings with God, with each other, with yourself. And now you all of a sudden start seeing, man, you start thinking your own life, you start talking about patterns of our culture. Maybe, maybe you're, 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 you work in a hospital and you constantly see people in tense situations. Maybe you're a high schooler and in school you just constantly see this tension, people hurting with each other. Maybe, maybe you're a teacher and you see these things. You constantly see this tension, having a, a broken relationship with ourselves, with each other, with God. There is no one who's righteous. So what's he saying here when he's saying that no one can come to me? Uh, think about this. So my, my favorite food... Uh, my favorite dessert, I've heard, I've said this before, is tiramisu. There's nothing as good as tiramisu if, it, fight me, you're wrong. Nothing as good as tiramisu. It's the best. Even bad tiramisu is better than whatever you think's better. Like, it's just, there, there's not a, man, gosh, I could talk forever about tiramisu. In fact, I'll, I, there's nothing to say. It's the best. Anyway, now, if someone presents me with tiramisu or a bowl full of monkey brains and feces, Yeah, take that in. What am I going to choose? Hey, hey, Joe, monkey brain or tiramisu? Tiramisu. F fantastic, right. What if I gave you two choices? Which one would you choose the second time? Tiramisu. Tiramisu. Oh. What if I gave you 3,000 choices? Would, it, would anyone in there not look like tiramisu? No. Are you saying that you're not going to choose in all the choices you have Monkey brain and feces. Never a no chance. Right. So it's, it's not that Joe and I or any of us, it's not that we can't choose it, the monkey brains, the feces. It's, it's that we can't want it on our own. We, we can't desire that. We can't want it. And if you're thinking about Indiana Jones and cake and monkey brains, I've got this image for you. You're welcome. Someone made a cake of the monkey brains from Indiana Jones. Anyone? No one's seen that movie except for me? Okay, fine, move on, sorry. That was just for me. Uh, but, so, you can't want it. You can't desire it. That's the issue. If you've had it, some of you are like, man, I didn't, you're talking about good food and steak, and now you're monkey brains, and I'm not here anymore. I'm, this is gross. I don't want this. That's the point. There's this attitude that you want something you desire, but now here's something you can't want. Your natural mind is hostile to God. You can't want this. It's not that you can't choose it. It's that you can't want it. You need something to change in you. When Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him, he's reminding us that we need something completely different, a fundamental heart change. As we've talked about before, Ezekiel mentions this. God prophesied this through his prophets. 
Many years before, Ezekiel 36 says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The Lord himself is going to put a new heart in us. He's going to put a new spirit in us. We can't do it on our own. It only comes from the Father. Remember uh, uh, Lydia in Acts, Acts 16, starting in uh, verse 14. One, of, uh, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia, as, as uh, Luke writes, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord, what? Opened her heart to pay attention. The Lord drew Lydia in. Paul was, Paul was preaching the gospel all over. But the Lord drew her and opened her heart. You start thinking, oh no, this means something. The Father is drawing you to believe in Jesus, to trust in Jesus because he loves you. What's he drawing you to? To believe in Jesus. Think, think about this. You, you might have some notion that you can unpack. I did all these things. Here's how I grew up in church and I walked down the aisle and I said this prayer and I do my Bible study and I follow, and those, that's fine. But, but who brought you to church? Who, who led the person to speak the gospel to you? Who, who drew you to walk down the aisle and, and to say a prayer? Who gave you the words to say? Who gave you the assurance? Who put their spirit in you to transform you and give you new life? It's the Father who draws us. It's the Father who does these things. You can't make yourself a Christian. That's actually a, bit, a meaningful part. Again, the more you think about it, the sweeter it gets. That separates us from every other religion and world we're out there. Right now, you can go look up how to be a good Buddhist, and they'll tell you exactly how to be a good Buddhist. Here's your checklist. Bob's your uncle. You're a good Buddhist. Way to go. You did it, chief. You're a better Buddhist than that person because you did this stuff. Right now, you could go and you could, you could approach Islam and you could figure out how to be a good Muslim and you could look at all the lists and say, look, I did all these things. I'm a good Muslim. I'm better than this person because I'm a better Muslim than them today because I did my list and I've done a little bit better than them. And you know, you've got your checklist. Mormonism, you can go and you can say, how do I be a better Mormon? And they'd say, well, here's your list. You should do this and you need to go on mission. You need to do these things and make sure you do this with your family and you've done these things. Now you're a better Mormon than other people. You've approached it. Atheism and agnosticism do the exact same thing. They say, hey, you can be whatever you want, however you want, and here's our plan for you. Here's, here's the sleep cycle, the workout routine, the kale smoothie, anything you want, the budgeting plan, the entrepreneur approach, how you can hustle and grind. You can do whatever you want, and we'll give you your checklist so every day you can become more and more, and it's all about you. But Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. By his love and grace. No fear, no weight, no crushing guilt, no shame. Just a new heart. A loving father's drawing. If your religion does not hang on the grace and love of the father giving us a right relationship with him in Jesus Christ because we've trusted alone in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, it's not Christianity. It's some other man-made concoction that evil or the world or your flesh has twisted to make it all about you, to make it about what you have to do, to make it all on your next step. Jesus says in verse 40, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Why? Why? Like what, why is it all on, on Jesus? Why would God do this? Why doesn't God give me a checklist? Why doesn't God tell me what to do in my retirement? Why doesn't God tell me what to do in my dating relationships with me? Why don't I have a list so that I can be perfect? Why is it that I look to Jesus and submit to him? What, why, 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 why? It all comes up. We get all this tension. God, if you just tell me what to do, I could do it. If God told you what, you, what to do and you did it, then you would get the glory for doing it. And it would be about you. If you have to open-handedly have faith in him and trust that Jesus is the one who does it, all of a sudden, it's about Jesus. Because Jesus is everything. Because all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. Not to me. Not to our church. To Jesus. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus. Why? Because he loves you. John already told us this. He answered in John 3, 16. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We're going to quote that verse every Sunday until you believe it. 
that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The heart and motivation behind God's drawing must be love. And unless you think, oh, well, that John said that in verse 3. Now we're in John chapter 6, and he's just drawing. Now it just seems like this cold-hearted deity who's forcing me, tying a leash around me, dragging me like you train a puppy on a leash. Oh, stop, stop. The whole message of the Bible is rooted in God's love for you, in righteousness, a right relationship. Look at Ephesians 1. He says, blessed be the God and Father. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In what? Love. Say in love. In love, he predestined us for adoption to him as sons through Jesus Christ. Stop getting hung up on the word predestined. You don't fully know what it means. I don't fully know what it means. Paul doesn't fully know what it means. Paul uses several analogies to try to explain these things. You can hang your hat on all sorts of reform theology and and all sorts of uh, election, all sorts of things, but you need to understand something. The most smartest person I know with all that still has questions, still opens his hands and says, man, I don't fully understand how God does this. We don't fully understand because we have a limitation of knowledge, limitation of language. Don't get hung up on the word predestined because Paul's point here is that he's done this in love, that he chose you in love, in love. Say in love. In love, he predestined us for adoption to him as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved, those who are loved, those who are in his love, gripped by him. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus because he loves you. Remember the Romans verses. Your mind is naturally hostile to God. No one is righteous. Something had to change. First Peter 3.18, Peter helps us. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Christ suffered once for sins. He died, he resurrected. The righteous, Jesus having a right relationship with God, a right relationship with himself, a right relationship with others. Read the story. Jesus is going around creating right relationships and he's fighting against people who are corrupt and breaking relationships and harming people with their religion or with with their oppression. Jesus is the ultimate authority on righteousness, on a right relationship with God, a right relationship with other people, a right relationship with himself. The righteous for the unrighteous, we do not have a right relationship with God. We're hostile to God. We're not righteous. We don't have a right relationship with ourselves. We're coming apart. We're broken. We're separated, as we talked about a few weeks ago. We don't have a right relationship with each other because even now, there's people in this room that prefer not to be around each other because there's brokenness and tension that happens. There's family members that you have to see every week. They're like, ugh. There's that person you've got to go see your job next week. You're like, oh my gosh, if only they just would transfer, get a new job, or fall into a hole, or whatever it may be. Like, we don't have a right relationship with each other. That's unrighteousness. God didn't create the world to be that way. Jesus suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. On the cross, Jesus took our sin and unrighteousness, our hostile minds towards God, and he put them to death and resurrected us into life so that we could be righteous in his spirit. He loves us. Paul reminds us in Romans 5, You see at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly die. But God demonstrates his own love for us, for you, for those who believe. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus. Because he loves you. The love of the Father is aggressive. That's why Jesus says, it's the Father who draws. The Father is drawing you. Only those the Father draws, and he is aggressively drawing you. As we talk about the Father drawing, it creates some tension in us, maybe some fear. Some evil is setting in, or some doubt, some questions. And some of those things can be good. God could be using those things. Say, hey, maybe, maybe you're thinking, have I been drawn? What does that look like? Maybe, maybe you haven't been saved, as they say in the church world, as the Bible says. <clears throat> maybe, maybe you think you've been saved and you haven't. Let me share a few things of comfort with you of what Scripture says. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, through believing. It turns out it's exactly what Jesus said. 
that you would believe. What's the will of God? That you would look to Jesus and believe. You would trust. We keep using the word trust because it's a slightly better translation because our culture where belief means nothing, right? Some of you believe the Chiefs are playing bad because they had a bad game once. Get over it. Like, sometimes your beliefs don't matter. They don't mean anything. In the world of the Bible, though, belief is everything. You can get killed for your beliefs. It really mattered. And so we use the word trust because it's an active posture of I trust in something. I trust this stage to hold me up. I trust my lungs not to explode today. I'm trusting things to go on that I maybe don't even fully control. That's what trust looks like. And he says we're saved by grace through faith. By grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not resulting from works so that you could boast. And Ephesians 1 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed. Say sealed. You were sealed in the promised Holy Spirit. That Greek word is a marking, like a king who sealed a letter. No one can open it except those who are authorized to open it. The king sealed it. He was in charge. It was the king's seal. It meant something. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit. When you put your faith in Jesus, when you hear the gospel of truth, and you say, I'm going to look to Jesus, I'm going to believe, the Holy Spirit enters you, and you're sealed. And this says, verse 14, it's our guarantee, our inheritance, until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. You are saved by faith in Jesus alone. Lest you're sitting here thinking, ooh, maybe I haven't been drawn. Maybe I'm not really saved. You're saved through faith in Jesus. If he is drawing you, you are putting faith in him. You believe and you are saved and you're sealed. Remember verse 39, Jesus says, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing. Say, Jesus loses nothing. Say it again like you believe it. Jesus loses nothing. If you believe in him, you are sealed by his spirit and he's not gonna lose you that I should lose nothing of all that the Father has given me, but I will raise them up in the last day. You're sealed in the Spirit. The Father is drawing you to believe, to trust in Jesus because he loves you. Listen, church, brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord is still drawing us. He's sovereign over us. His plans are still to prosper. He's not forgotten us. All of us in this room No one is too retired, too old, too single, too broken, too young, too high school, too addicted, too ADHD, too depressed, too busy, too poor. God is still sovereign over you. He is the one who draws. He is the one, the author and perfecter of your faith. He's the one that causes the sun to rise and the moon to rise, the sun to set. He's the one that controls everything. He is sovereign over you. Every moment of your life, he is drawing you. You can't sit there and say, oh, my excuse is I'm retired. Oh, my excuse is that she left me. Oh, my excuse is that my math class is really hard. Oh, my excuse is that I'm still hiding my pill addiction. My excuse is that I still have suicide ideation. Stop. He's still drawing you. And maybe that drawing looks like getting a great counselor and getting medication. Praise God. Maybe that drawing looks like releasing the fact that your credit hours are crushing you. And he gave you that, so you've got to trust him. Maybe it looks like releasing the fact you have no idea where this relationship's going, but, but God brought in your life and you're just like, I'm trying to trust the Lord here. All of those things, then we look to Jesus and we look to what he's given us. He's given us the church. He's given us his body to grow. His plans are still to prosper. He's not forgotten us. What has he called you to? To believe in Jesus. It's a famous hymn. Some of you remember it and probably could tell me where it's at in the Baptist hymnal. I don't remember such things, but it's called, Tis Not That I Did Choose Thee. It's a famous hymn that goes like this. It was grace in Christ that called me, taught my darkened heart and mind. Else the world and yet enthralled me to your heavenly glories blind. Now I worship none above you. For your grace alone I thirst, knowing well that if I loved you, Oh, Father, you loved me first. Here's the amazing truth about his love and grace. Even as one who's been saved in Christ, who's pursuing and following him, we still need Jesus. Jesus tells his disciples in John 15, these are his disciples that have given their lives to follow him. They're all meeting with him. He directly tells his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, it is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do. Hear me. If you're a Christian, 
If you're a believer in Jesus, if you've said, I've given my life to him and I look to Jesus just as John says, his plans are still for you. He still has a plan for your life. He's still guiding you. You don't have an excuse. He's not the one who's ignorant, apathetic, and negligent. That's what happens to us. Evil's the one that tries to distract us and give us excuses. So the question is, what is he drawing you to? He's drawing you to belief in Jesus. So what does that belief, that trust be look like in your life? Is it motivated by love? Is it transforming you? Is it causing you to follow him? Here's what following Christ looks like. Very simple, if you want to know. It looks like a growing affection to the Lord and following Jesus because Jesus told us that you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And by his spirit, you have conviction and transformation in Christ. That looks like increasing victory over sin in Christ in your life and increasing fruit of the spirit. If you don't see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control growing in your life, if you don't have a growing affection for Jesus, if you're not constantly asking in your life, but what about my relationship with Jesus? How does this impact my relationship with Jesus? How does this impact me pursuing Jesus? How does this impact me being a disciple? If those things aren't coming out of you, uh, sorry to be the first to tell you, but I love you. You might not be a follower of Jesus. You might not be a Christian. His spirit might not be in you. And thank God that you have this opportunity now, whether you're young or old or in between, you're hearing that, hey, maybe you don't know King Jesus. He's drawing you now because he loves you. The Father is drawing you to believe and trust in Jesus because he loves you. We need him. Our two options are to look to Jesus and be transformed by his spirit into eternal life, starting now, or to rebel, to give in to our fear, our control, our patterns of escape. As we respond this morning, as the band comes and, and settles our response song, I want you to think about something that we taught last week, because I think it's so so relevant here. When I think about, man, what's the barrier here? When, when we sit and we frustrate over Scripture and we pray and we wrestle, and I just can't stop hearing God tell me, it is the Father who draws. It is the Father who draws. And I feel like this is what we need to be teaching this week. One of the things when I think about how do we apply that, I think about last week when Jesus says, it is I, do not be afraid. I I spend a lot of my time meeting with people one-on-one. You know, a pastor is a a big word, and it's a gamut of different things. Some pastors do more of this and more of that. I know pastors who are far better preachers than I am because they probably spend far more time studying than I do, although I feel like I never stop reading and studying, and it's so hard. But uh, I spend most of my time, I notice, just sitting with people. A lot of counseling, a lot of talking, a lot of wrestling through things. And I'll tell you something I know for a fact, just meeting with people, seeing eye contact right now, people that, that I talk to every week people that aren't even here, we are all so afraid. Last week we said, in a world without God, which is what the world wants to tell you, there is no God, it's just you, there's only fear. Because at the base of your amygdala is fear. Your brain's base function is fear to protect itself, to fight or flight. That is your base core. Maybe you're afraid of not being enough of a mother. Maybe you're afraid of not being enough of a student. Maybe you're afraid of not being enough of a daughter or in a relationship. You're afraid of something. Maybe I'm not, I'm not a big enough man anymore because I'm retired and my body's getting old. No offense to anyone. But like maybe some, there's a fear there. Something creeps in. And because of that fear, we seek to control. It's why Cain killed Abel. It's why we decided to leave in the garden and say, we're going to eat the fruit. We're going to rebel because we're afraid. We want to be in control. And when that fear plays out into control and we can't actually control things, then all we have is escape. That's why you see so many people destroying their marriages with porn and affairs, so many people getting into drug addictions, video game addictions, busyness. I'm just going to become a workaholic and throw myself in. We have to escape. We have to escape the reality that we don't actually have control because we're so afraid. And Jesus steps in and he says, do not fear. Hear me. I love you. The Father is drawing you to believe and trust in Jesus because he loves you. Hear these words in John 4, 1 John 4. There is no fear in love. Say, no fear in love. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Why? Because there is no fear in love. We love because he first loved us. Let go of your fear, of your control, of your escape. As we take time to respond right now, 
you need to know that it's the Father who draws you to believe in Jesus because he loves you. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. And the world, the flesh, and the devil is fighting so hard to make you believe that you're alone and you're not lovable. That your guilt and shame can control you. That you need to hold on to your fear. You are loved. And so this morning, you can open your hands. And as a response, you can say, Father, you are drawing me. Because you're here. He's put you here this morning. He's put you here watching. You're listening to this in the future. And you're saying, man, he is drawing you because he loves you. And he wants you to hear that this is your moment. Today's the day of salvation. Today's your moment to look to him, to get rid of your fear, to stop escaping, to say, in Jesus' name, I want to be made new. I need to be transformed by a spirit. I can't choose it on my own. He is drawing me. The Father loves you. He's drawing you to believe in Jesus because of his great love for you. There is no fear in love. He loves you. Respond to him now. Open your hands. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd guide this time of response. I pray that you'd be moving as we boldly step out, whether we were coming up front, we're finding people on the sides to pray with. God, I pray, sitting in our seats, that your spirit would move. We trust you in this time. that that those who need to find you, that you'd continue to draw them because we believe in your word. And your word tells us that you are drawing us to belief in Jesus, that Jesus is the only place that we have life. Jesus is everything. Thank you for your love for us. God, I pray that we would believe in your love, that everyone sitting here hearing this would believe that you love them, that you're the father who draws us and that that would transform us. Guide us in your spirit as we respond. Thank you for your great love for us. Amen. If you need someone to pray with, there's people on the side. I'll be down here. Stand and sing with us. Open your hands as you respond to Jesus.